Hey guys, we are officially about to start the play the Diary of Anne Frank, um, or Anne Frank, if you want to say it correctly. Um, so what's cool is this is going to be read by a full cast of characters, so you guys can listen in as the different characters are voiced. Our cast of characters uh, include Anne and her older sister, Margot, their father, Mr. Frank, and their mother, Mrs. Frank. The Van Dans, who is another family that's like crammed into this tiny space with them. Peter makes it really interesting because he is right between uh, Anne and Margot's age, and then his parents. And Mr. Dussel is a dentist we'll meet later. Meep and Mr. Crawler are the ones who are helping all the people who live in the annex, who help to like bring them what they need. So we're gonna go ahead and get started, but it's gonna start by setting the scene um, and let us kind of visualize what's going on. Anytime you see something later in italics, that's gonna be stage directions. So for example, you see here Meep's uh, in the script, you see Meep's dialogue that says, everyone in the office has gone home, it's after six. And then in parentheses, it says, then pleading. So anytime you guys see that, it's not going to be read aloud because that's a stage direction that helps us visualize what the actors are doing um, and know kind of what they're thinking and feeling. So without further ado, here we go. Amsterdam, the time, July, 1942 to August, 1944, November, 1945. The place, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. The scene remains the same throughout the play. It is the top floor of a warehouse and office building in Amsterdam, Holland, outlined against a sea of other rooftops, stretching away into the distance. Nearby is the belfry of a church tower, the Vestertoren, whose carillon rings out the hours. Occasionally, faint sounds float up from below. The voices of children playing in the street the tramp of marching feet, a boat whistle from the canal. The three rooms of the top floor and a small attic space above are exposed to our view. The largest of the rooms is in the center, with two small rooms slightly raised on either side. On the right is a bathroom, out of sight. A narrow, steep flight of stairs at the back leads up to the attic. The rooms are sparsely furnished, with a few chairs, cots, a table or two. The windows are painted over, or covered with makeshift blackout curtains. In the main room, there is a sink, a gas ring for cooking, and a wood-burning stove for warmth. The room on the left is hardly more than a closet. There is a skylight in the sloping ceiling. Directly under this room, is a small steep stairwell with steps leading down to a door. A secret door. This is the only entrance from the building below. When the door is opened, we see that it has been concealed on the outer side by a bookcase attached to it. Act one, scene one. Here we go. The curtain rises on an empty stage. It is late afternoon, November, 1945. The rooms are dusty, the curtains in rags. Chairs and tables are overturned. The door at the foot of the small stairwell swings open. Mr. Frank comes up the steps into view. He is a gentle, cultured European in his middle years. There is still a trace of a German accent in his speech. He stands, looking slowly around making a supreme effort at self-control. Here's a picture of Otto. He is weak, ill. His clothes are threadbare. After a second, he drops his rucksack on the couch and moves slowly about. He opens the door to one of the smaller rooms and then abruptly closes it again, turning away. He goes to the window at the back, looking off at the vestor torrent as its carillon strikes the hour of six. Then he moves restlessly on. From the street below, we hear the sound of a barrel organ and children's voices at play. There is a many-colored scarf hanging from a nail. Mr. Frank takes it, putting it around his neck. As he starts back for his rucksack, his eye is caught by something lying on the floor. It is a woman's white glove. 
He holds it in his hand. And suddenly, all of his self-control is gone. He breaks down, crying. We hear footsteps on the stairs. Meep Geese comes up, looking for Mr. Frank. Meep is a Dutch girl of about 22. She wears a coat and hat, ready to go home. She is pregnant. Her Excuse attitude me. toward Mr. Frank is protective, compassionate. Are you all right, Mr. Frank? Yes, Meep, yes. Everyone in the office has gone home. It's after six. Don't stay up here, Mr. Frank. What's the use of torturing yourself like this? I've come to say goodbye. I'm leaving here, Meep. What do you mean? Where are you going? Where? I don't know yet. I haven't decided. Mr. Frank, you can't leave here. This is your home. Amsterdam is your home. Your business is here, waiting for you. You're needed here. Now that the war is over, there are things that... I can't stay in Amsterdam, me. It has too many memories for me. Everywhere there's something. The house we lived in, the school, that street organ playing out there. I'm not the person you used to know, me. I'm a bitter old man. Forgive me. I shouldn't speak to you like this. After all you did for us, the suffering... No. No. It wasn't suffering. You can't say we suffered. I know what you went through, you and Mr. Crawler. I remember it as long as I live. Come, Meep. He starts for the steps, then remembers his rucksack, going back to get it. Mr. Frank, did you see? There are some of your papers here. We found them in a heap of rubbish on the floor after... after you left. Burn them. He opens his rucksack to put the glove in it. But, Mr. Frank, there are letters, notes. Burn them. All of them. Burn this? She hands him a paper-bound notebook. Anne's diary. Monday, the 6th of July, 1942. 1942? Is it possible, me? Only three years ago. Dear Diary, since you and I are going to be great friends, I'm going to pause for just a minute here to make a point that before at the beginning of this play, so far we've been in 1945, Otto Frank has been looking at the empty uh, dust strewn annex and now he's going to start reading out of Anne's diary um, and we're about to have what is known as a flashback. So a lot of our play is going to take place um, back in the past and it's going to be remembered by Mr. Frank. I will start by telling Anne's diary. Monday, the 6th of July, 1942. 1942? Is it possible, me? Only three years ago. Dear diary, since you and I are going to be great friends, I will start by telling you about myself. My name is Anne Frank. I am 13 years old. I was born in Germany the 12th of June, 1929. As my family is Jewish, we emigrated to Holland when Hitler came to power. My, my father, father started, started a business, importing spice and herbs. herbs. Things went well for us until 1940. Then the war came, and the Dutch capitulation, followed by the arrival of the Germans. Then things got very bad for the Jews. You could not do this, and you could not do that. They forced father out of his business. We had to wear yellow stars. I had to turn in my bike. I couldn't go to a Dutch school anymore. I couldn't go to the movies, or ride in an automobile, or even on a streetcar, and a million other things. But somehow we children still managed to have fun. Yesterday, Father told me we were going into hiding. Where, he wouldn't say. At five o'clock this morning, 
Mother woke me and told me to hurry and get dressed. I was to put on as many clothes as I could. It would look too suspicious if we walked along carrying suitcases. It wasn't until we were on our way that I learned where we were going. Our hiding place was to be upstairs in the building where Father used to have his business. Three other people were coming in with us, the Vandans and their son Peter. Father knew the Vandans, but we had never met them. Continuing on to scene two. Scene two. It is early morning, July 1942. The rooms are bare, as before, but they are now clean and orderly. Mr. Van Damme, a tall, portly man in his late forties, is in the main room, pacing up and down, nervously smoking a cigarette. His clothes and overcoat are expensive and well cut. I just want to point out that we are still in that flashback. We know that because scene two begins with our date, July 1942. So we are towards the beginning of when the family has gone into hiding in that secret annex. If you want to see pictures of the annex um, and what it looks like, make sure you guys watch that clip from uh, the other day where we introduce Anne Frank and, and what our hiding place looked like. Mrs. Van Damme sits on the couch, clutching her possessions, a hat box, bags, etc. She is a pretty woman in her early 40s. She wears a fur coat over her other clothes. Peter Van Damme is standing at the window of the room on the right, looking down at the street below. He is a shy, awkward boy of 16. He wears a cap, a raincoat, and long Dutch trousers, like plus fours. At his feet is a black case, a carrier for his cat. The yellow star of David is conspicuous on all of their clothes. Something's happened to them. The yellow star of David is conspicuous on all Something of their clothes. Something obvious or very easy to see. Something's happened to them. I know it. Now, Curly. Mr. Frank said they'd be here at seven o'clock. He said they had two miles to walk. You can't expect. They've been picked up. That's what's happened. They've been taken. Mr. Van Damme indicates that he hears someone coming. You see? Peter takes up his carrier and his school bag, etc., and goes into the main room as Mr. Frank comes up the stairwell from below. Mr. Frank looks much younger now. His movements are brisk, his manner confident. He wears an overcoat and carries his hat and a small cardboard box. He crosses to the Van Dans, shaking hands with each of them. I want to point something out here. We've been talking about how setting influences a character's values, beliefs, motivations, and their perspective. So you'll notice that Mrs. Van Dan and her family here are coming to join the Franks in hiding. And so they've had to put on all their clothes, couldn't carry suitcases either, although Peter still brought his cat. Um, and they're really worried that the Franks aren't going to be there to welcome them into the hiding place. So it makes sense because of this really scary time that they're living in, that their fear is heightened, right? Um, that they might be picked up by, have been picked up by the Nazis. All right, so here's Mr. Frank. Mrs. Van Damme, Mr. Van Damme, Peter. There were too many of the green police on the streets. We had to take the long way around. Up the steps come Margot Frank, Mrs. Frank. Me, not pregnant now, and Mr. Crawler. All of them carry bags, packages, and so forth. The Star of David is conspicuous on all of the Franks' clothing. Margot is 18, beautiful, quiet, shy. Mrs. Frank is a young mother, gently bred, reserved. She, like Mr. Frank, has a slight German accent. Mr. Crawler is a Dutchman. Dependable, kindly. As Mr. Crawler and Meek go upstage to put down their parcels, Mrs. Frank turns back to call Ann. Ann? Ann comes running up the stairs. She is 13, quick in her movements, interested in everything, mercurial in her emotions. She wears a cape, 
long wool socks, and carries a school bag. So mercurial, if you guys think we used to use mercury in thermometers, we don't use it anymore because you know, it's dangerous. Um, but if somebody's mercurial, it means that their emotions let go up and down. Uh, so her emotions are strong and they like change quickly. My wife, Edith, Mr. and Mrs. Van Damme, their son, Peter, my daughters, Margo and Anne. Anne gives a polite little curtsy as she shakes Mr. Van Damme's hand. Then she immediately starts off on a tour of investigation of her new home, going upstairs to the attic room. Meep and Mr. Crawler are putting the various things they have brought on the shelves. I'm sorry there is still so much confusion. Please, don't think of it. After all, we'll have plenty of leisure to arrange everything ourselves. We put the stores of food you sent in here. Your drugs are here. Soap, linen here. Thank you, Meep. Drugs is in medicine. I made up the beds, the way Mr. Frank and Mr. Crawler said. Forgive me, I have to hurry. I've got to go to the other side of town to get some ration books for you. Ration books? If they see our names on ration books, they'll know we're here. So a ration book is a book of coupons that are issued to people during wartime to help ration the items to make sure you don't run out of toilet paper, like in a pandemic. So you get a coupon and you can only get as many things as you have in that ration book. Um, but that's also how you get your groceries and supplies. So it's dangerous for the Van Dans and the Francs to use their ration books because they'll know that they're still somewhere in Amsterdam. Um, so they are going to have to use Meep and Mr. Crawler's um, uh, ration books or those that are donated by other people who are willing to help them. So Mr. Crawler and Meep are the two that can go in and out of the annex and they're the ones who will be bringing supplies and food um, to the Van Dans and the Francs who cannot leave their hiding place anymore. There isn't anything. Don't worry. Your names won't be on them. I'll be up later. Thank you, Meep. It's illegal then. The ration books We've never done anything illegal. We won't be living here exactly according to regulations. As Mr. Crawler reassures Mrs. Frank, he takes very small things, such as matches, soap, etc., from his pockets, handing them to her. This isn't the black market, Mrs. Frank. This is what we call the white market, helping all of the hundreds and hundreds who are hiding out in Amsterdam. The carillon is heard playing the quarter hour before eight. Mr. Crawler looks at his watch. Anne stumps at the window as she comes down the stairs. It's the Wester Torrin. I must go. I must be out of here and downstairs in the office before the workmen get here. Me or I or both of us will be up each day to bring you food and news and find out what your needs are. Tomorrow, I'll get you a better bolt for the door at the foot of the stairs. It needs a bolt that you can throw yourself. Sorry, that was the bell. So it needs a bolt that you can throw yourself and open only at our signal. Oh, you'll tell them about the noise? I'll tell them. And friends, it's not going to be good noise. Uh, good news. <laughs> good news. Uh, because how do you think it's going to go if the offices are still full of people and they are literally living in the annex right by them, but they have to stay there secretly. So the families are about to get some really bad noise. Uh, I'm just going to start saying noise instead of news. Going to get some really bad news about the whole noise regulations and rules. So we'll find that out in our next installment of Anne Frank. All right, guys. Talk to you later. Make sure that you are going to your Anne Frank um document. We got this from clicking on our stuff on Monday. Make sure you put your name at the top and then um, answer in the box that it asks you to answer in. So for today's answers, you'll start in box three. The instructions are going to be directly on your Canvas work for today. All right, that's a wrap. See you later. Bye.